So we have this started a little early. Um, we will go ahead and just wait a few minutes for everyone to have the time to join for this meeting. It's just about 5.30, but I see there are still people joining the meeting, so we'll give them another minute. Hey, Lee. This is John. You get your hands full, don't you? You think? <laughs> yep. Oh my gosh. I just can't believe what you guys are involved in. I mean, uh, you know, I was out at the aquatic center today and and I, I, I've i seen those kids in the, the room and I asked, who is the, you know, what is that about? And it like, oh my gosh, I thought, you guys, cool. Who, cool. who thought of that? Derek, who thought of that? Uh, Becky Childers. Actually, that was, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, Becky one of, one of our, to us. One of us, yeah, the ladies that worked for us saw the need and the idea was up up more for all city employees and made all the sense. That's so cool to see those kids out there. Yeah, the one that Nat's doing at Carnegie's pretty impressive too with the, the kids with the IEP. Oh. She's, she's got her hands full, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, how many kids are participating in something like that? I think she's on a full day, she'll have 12. No kidding. Yep. Wow. How'd you guys get involved in, in, in that? I mean, a lot of a lot of it's staff that deals with that those clients, but particularly Annette, um, she saw the need for that because these kids were basically doing online learning at home, and parents reached out and oh. asked her to put something together. And boy, she's just been a, she's been a rock star at it. I mean, it's it's pretty impressive when, and I think I shared this with the with the group the last time when one of the IEPs states on the form that it's just to have a better day than they did the day before. Oh. Um, and oh. so she's oh, been able to do that. Hey, Lee, can you hear me? Yes, sir. I had a 
some people from Wichita call me. They were starting trying to do something like that for IEP kids in this pandemic. And um, they knew I was on the rec commission and they knew I'd talked about this to them. They may give you a call. I gave your name and I gave Derek's name because I didn't know the logistics, but they were really wanting to know about it. And I said, you know, from what I've seen and heard, it is really cool for those kids that don't get lost like what you're talking about. So they may call you. I don't know who it might be. Right. No, that's good. We, we could definitely hook them up with, with Annette and staff and people that have been really behind the scenes. Actually, they were the ones that brought this. I mean, they're, they're, the, they're the ones that did all this. And, and not only those, we, we talked about those too, and I know this may be getting ahead of the meeting, but yeah, the boys great, Lee. Let's go ahead and, and dig in. It's about uh, 535. Does that work for everyone? I know we're all excited. We're all ready to have a meeting on this uh, Monday night. All right. It looks like um, all the board members who are able to attend are here. I'd like to welcome everyone to the December 14th meeting of the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. Uh, my name is Penny Holler. I'll be facilitating the Zoom portion of this meeting. I'm joined here by Director Derek Rogers and additional Parks and Rec staff via Zoom. This meeting is being recorded and broadcast on the city's YouTube channel. During the meeting, please mute yourself by clicking on the microphone icon found in the lower left-hand side of the Zoom menu. This is also the section where you can turn your camera on and off. For purposes of this public meeting, please keep your video on during the meeting. For general public comment, Chair Bart Littlejohn will call you by name to speak. Each participant has three minutes for public comment. After public comment is over, you're welcome to stay on the call if you would like. For comments on agenda items, Chair Littlejohn will call you by name after the staff presentation. Each participant has three minutes for public comment. Board members will then continue their discussion. As a reminder, please state your name and title each time you speak. And if a vote is necessary, the chair will capture votes from each advisory board member separately by roll call vote. With that, I would like to turn the meeting back over to Chair Bart Littlejohn. Hey everyone, sorry I was a little bit late. I was picking up my son. Uh, and uh, thank you all for coming today. That was that is really cool. And uh, I'll go ahead and get it started off, call this meeting to order. Um, I don't believe, Oh, there it is. Uh, okay, if you haven't had a chance yet, if you could, you please review the minutes from the previous meeting. I uh, believe that was November 9th. I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes as presented. This is uh, Pat Collette. Okay, that's Pat. Lozick will second him. Oh, no, go ahead, John. I'm sorry, Bart. John Lozick will second him. Okay, that's Pat, Pat Collette with a motion to approve and John Blazik with a second. Uh, is, are there any uh, further questions or any sort of comments? Seeing and hearing none, I would like uh, to go ahead and call a uh, vote to go ahead and approve or deny the minutes. Uh, all those in favor of approving, either say aye or raise your hand. Any opposed? Seeing as there are none, minutes are approved. All right. Penny Holler, management analyst, just to note for the record that uh, board member Sandy Hall is absent from this meeting. Hmm. Yes. Uh, do we do we need to go into why? Uh, just probably. <laughs> uh, yes, I think we can cover that perhaps on agenda item number one. Okay. Cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, first of all, public comment though, correct? Uh, and I think we have a couple folks that for public comment. I know. I briefly scanned the email you sent. <laughs> I think it was about uh, 10 or 15 minutes ago. Uh, who is uh, who are the folks that we have for public comment again? 
So I have two people registered. I have Steve Ozark and Lynn Gimple. I'm not sure if they'd like to speak during general public comment or if they'd like to speak to specific agenda items or both. So if they could maybe let us know. <laughs> Hi, this is Lynn Gimple. I'm with the Mutt Run Advocates. And I signed up because I saw that Mark was giving a community engagement update. So I thought I'm, I'm part of the community. So <laughs> uh, it's up to you. I can speak separately or I can wait till after Mark speaks. Uh, yeah, let's probably hold it until like when Mark gives his presentation there. That would probably be a little bit better. Thank you for being accommodating with that. Um, and I believe it was uh, Steve Ozark or Scott Ozark. I do have a Mr. Steve Ozark registered. I don't see him yet in the meeting. Um, so um, we will just hopefully he's speaking regarding a specific agenda item and can um, join the meeting if he's able. Okay. That sounds good to me. We'll go ahead and get it going then. Uh, starting off with the first agenda item, uh, advisory board selection, uh, uh, chair selection. Uh, just a note, uh, what we were referring to before, uh, Sandy Hole is not joining us today, but unfortunately, Sh Sandy Hole is going to be resigning from the board here for the next session. So um, I definitely wanted to go ahead and let everybody know and also say how much I enjoyed working with her and her being a part of this board. It's been a real pleasure to go ahead and get to know her over these couple of years, and she will be sorely missed. Uh, and now I will turn it over to Penny for the actual uh, uh, information on the chair selection there. Penny Holler, Management Analyst. Um, so before I, I get into um, just a reminder that um, the board will be selecting a new chair and vice chair at the January meeting, um, it's helpful to know who will be attending that January meeting as far as advisory board members. So as Chair Little John mentioned, um, Sandy Hall, um, uh, uh, we truly really want to thank her for um, her, her work um, on the board and we will miss her. Um, there also, um, we want to mention that uh, Pat Collette um, uh, was, um, has accepted um, to uh, provide service to the Multimodal Transportation Commission. So she will also uh, be leaving us on the Parks and Rec Advisory Board because she had to um, pick one. Um, I mean, I thought she could have done two, but uh, apparently we, we made her choose. So uh, Pat, is there anything you'd like to say about that? Yeah, uh, thank you, Penny. Uh, this is Pat Collette. Uh, yeah, I've really enjoyed being on uh, this advisory committee and I, it was a really hard choice. I, I, I didn't feel that it was probably appropriate to be on, on both and, and time-wise probably not, not feasible, but um, I've really uh, enjoyed being on the, in the Parks and Rec, Parks and Rec uh, Advisory Board and will miss being a part of this group. So yes, thank you, uh, Pat, for all, all your efforts. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure working with you. Thanks for, um, thanks for working with us on this. We're gonna miss you. It was Roger Strick for Parks and Recreation. I'm sure we'll have the opportunity in the coming year to work closely together uh, between Parks and Rec and the multimodals. Um, so with that, I um, would also like to recognize that John Blazik has been reappointed for a two-year term to the Parks and Rec Advisory Board. So we will have a familiar face staying on with us. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> and um, also wanted to um, let you know that um, we have a new advisory board member who will be joining us at our January meeting, um, Amber Nickel. Um, Derek, did you want to go ahead and? I'm, I'm sure some of you are, uh, know her. She's the owner of uh, Pause Wash. And Amber and I went through leadership awards uh, together back in 08. I think she'll be a, a great addition to the board and we'll bring some different perspectives. And uh, I'm really looking forward to having her on the board. 
So if, if we've all done our math, how do you holler management analysts? If we've done our math, we've come to realize that there is one open seat for the Parks and Rec Advisory Board. Um, I am waiting to hear um, regarding uh, Mayor Finkeldye's selection um, that will, I assume, go through a city commission um, approval process. So um, I will let you know as soon as I know who else will be joining us for our January meeting. Um, we do intend to have an orientation for new advisory board members, try to get them a little bit caught up to speed on uh, some of the items that we've been discussing over the last few years and kind of get them set. Um, but you should expect to meet them in person, in Zoom, um, in January. Penny, this is John Blazik. Hey, when you go through that orientation, would you remind me, are you gonna take them out on a bus tour? <laughs> Virtual bus tour. <laughs> Guess we, yeah, at some point we'll, we'll need to do that. Oh, that well, you probably can't right now. Yeah. But if you do it, let me go because I missed it twice last year. I was a ding dong. Penny Heller, management analyst. I think we're still working on how that's going to go in COVID. Obviously, we would love to get them uh, with the ability to see our facilities and parks and other things. So um, I think we'll. Have to figure that out. It might be more video tour and Zoom chatting, um, but hopefully soon we could get them to where we can, um, you know, bring them in and, and meet staff and um, kind of see what we do. And if we do that, uh, yes, we'll definitely make sure we, uh, if we can, invite everyone else who would like to participate in that as well. It's not meant to be uh, exclusive. It's just meant to give them a good orientation to the board. So with those updates, um, this should be fairly brief. Uh, once the full board is seated in January, um, you will be selecting from amongst yourselves a chair and a vice chair. Um, the responsibilities for the chair include speaking on behalf of the board if necessary at the city commission and um, working with staff to establish agendas, address uh, questions, and um, getting to facilitate uh, the meetings. Um, and for the vice chair, it is all of those responsibilities as well um, if the chair is unable to perform them. So um, in some ways it's a little extra time commitment. Um, so for your consideration, um, you know, who, whoever um, would need to probably be willing to work with staff um, and be um, committed when possible to attend the advisory board meetings. Any questions on that? Great. Penny, this is Val Renault. Does the vice chair tends to move into the chair position? Is that right or do we? Penny Hall, management analyst, uh, that would really be for um, the board members to determine amongst yourselves. Oh, okay. So you'll be voting for your chair and vice chair. Um, that, that's only my only staff guidance is just to keep in mind the responsibilities, but that would certainly be something you could consider during that discussion. There will be a discussion and then a formal vote. Okay. Thank you. Okie dokie. Uh, thank you for that, Penny. I uh, appreciate that. Does anybody else have any questions of Penny before we move on to the next agenda item? All righty. Uh, moving on to agenda item number two, uh, Camp Woody update. Uh, looking forward to this. Uh, Derek, if you could go ahead and let us know about that, we'd appreciate it. Okay, Derek Rogers, Director of Parks and Recreation. Uh, talking with the person that works our grants for emergency support grants, it looks like we've got the green light to operate the campsite at Woody Park to continue it on after December 30th through uh, the end of our special event permit, which ends March 31st. Things at the campsite are going, I think, very well. Um, I've had a, maybe one complaint from a neighbor on a, a dispute that happened in the camp that was verbal. 
Uh, it's, it's, excuse me, Derek. Uh, and Penny, um, I think we're, we have a couple comments from folks that they're having trouble hearing, Derek. Is there any way we can? Oh, I'm back up. Yeah, I was going to say, oh, oh, I'm going to, can okay. you still see me? Let's see. All right. I'm going to yeah. sit over here. Okay. This. I, I apologize yes. for interrupting, but I, yeah. I'm still figuring this out. Bear with us. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so we, um, the emergency support grant funds, we went in for, for the second half of Camp Woody. Uh, for the campsite at Woody Park. The first part was CARES, which expires on December 30th. The second uh, grant we went in for was $150,000 uh, from the state. Everything we're seeing is we got the green light. So our plan is to operate the camp through March 31st and continue that on. Currently there's, uh, I believe, 19 people in the camp and Bert Nash through the HUD rapid rehousing has gotten two of the campers to uh, a uh, more permanent sheltered housing. So that's pretty awesome. That's what we want to see uh, happen. Um, I think it's the support's going well. Uh, one of the things that we're learning <clears throat> from a formal sanctioned campsite is there's less problems than just informal random camping around the city. Uh, so that's been really good. Um, we have had volunteer COVID testing. And so, uh, so far we've, we've had one person test during that. And so we haven't had any outbreaks or anything, but we did transfer one person to the uh, Baymont Hotel for that. See what else I've got on there. Oh, we got the trailers. That's really cool. We got the shower trailers in. Uh, first one came in, was hooked up on Thursday. They are really nice. I was talking to some of the campers over there and um, I could just tell that the one individual I talked to felt so much better after a good shower. He goes, we need to put time limits on these showers because people are just gonna get too comfortable in there. <laughs> um, got the second one in. We do have a laundry trailer coming. It should be here uh, possibly into this week, if not next week. That'd be a nice amenity to have on, on site. Um, I think talking to some of the individuals, they realize it's a temporary shelter and they're all looking forward to that next step of a more permanent housing solution. Um, the number of homeless that Bert Nash services, uh, one of the outworkers said it was 500. So if you have four caseworkers per 500 people, doesn't give you much time uh, for them to work with folks. So they really have their hands full and a few of them kind of are getting cabin fever and want, I want that next step. I can't get a hold of my case manager. Um, so I really feel for them. And I know I'm gonna be missing something, but what are the questions from the board? John? You're muted, John. Um, yeah, uh, John, I, I just, yeah. Just unmuted myself. Uh, Derek, uh, given the Woody Park and also what you guys are doing at the Aquatic Center with the employees, children, and so on and so forth, um, I doubt that that's part of a formal uh, responsibility of the Parks and Rec uh, Department. And I would encourage you to review the formalities of how Parks and Rec is conceived of in this community and, and to make the formal uh, declaration of what Parks and Rec is about to uh, conform to what you guys are doing now. Because what I what you're doing now to me is, it's 21st century. And I'll bet the Parks and Rec uh, mission is, you know, a little bit uh, dated. Thank you, John, Dick Rogers, Parks and Rec. Um, definitely, and you know, the, the campsite was a pilot program, which is nice. And it, it's what's 
the city should do, whether it be MSO or us or, or BDS, somebody or all of us should try to work together to solve some of our community problems. So, um, appreciate that. Uh, the the uh, schools, um, the pool school, um, remote learning and the IEPs and the Boys and Girls Club are uh, three programs we're, we're partnering with Boys and Girls Club and there's a uh, agenda item tomorrow night, I believe, requesting uh, potentially waiving half of the fees for the Boys and Girls Club so that they can utilize our facilities at Sports Million Lawrence for uh, January. So that gives them some stability. Um, like all of us, we don't know what the schools are going to do in that first month of January and so that the staff and the kids and parents can have continuity. We requested that. They're going in for additional funding. There may not be any waiver of fees. It was about $13,000, if I recall. <clears throat> but we just wanted to make sure that that was transparent and we were supporting our partners in the community. Uh, this is Val Renault, board member. I just wanted to say, um, I was listening, a lot of you probably know Steve Kraske's show on the NPR station in Kansas City this morning. And um, there was a man there from the downtown council in Kansas City, Missouri, talking about their homeless issues. And they looked to Lawrence, uh, to Camp Woody, and uh, are, are going to try to emulate us. And I just wanted to say, you know, as John Nalbandian said, we are, I think, really leading the way in this, you know, in a, a humane, he was talking about something also that he mentioned that not everyone may know about is that there are porta potties by the outdoor pool now. And some people might complain about it, but as he said, it's a humane way to give people a place to go to the bathroom, you know, if they aren't in the camp or something. So I'm just really proud of our town and um, our Parks and Rec for, for dealing with this problem in such a way. And he and I had to laugh because the interviewer asked and he said, well, what's the camp like? And he said, well, I led Boy Scouts and it's kind of like a Boy Scout camp. <laughs> and I thought, well, there's Derek's background probably with, you know, having it very everything's laid out very orderly and there's a code of conduct and all that. So I it was just great to hear him talking about our city and, and how we're leading the way for others. So thank you. Uh, Parks Rec, thank you for sharing that. And again, it, we want to be emulated on, hey, look how well Lawrence did it and not, uh, it didn't do it right. And I think that's where our drive's been and with the community partners, the neighborhood, and LMH and just the community in general has come out with donations. And it's, it's like, you want to see these folks succeed and that's been really cool. Derek, this is John Blazik. <clears throat> you know, I've been here six, eight years now and you and I've chatted about this the last three years. I want to reiterate, I'm just amazed with what you guys do as a Parks and Recs. I mean, it doesn't matter what challenge is given you, you guys take it head on. This is another example of just how how positive the parks and recs are to Lawrence, Kansas. And when I'm out traveling and stuff in the state, once again, I'm going to brag about you. And I just, just another, another check mark for you, all of you. Um, great job. Can't say enough good things. Thank you. This is Pat Phillips, board member. Um, Derek, after March, is, are there certain things that have been put in place that will continue even through the, the warm months or even talk of areas that homeless people can camp and it would be allowed? Derek Rogers, Director of Parks and Recreation. Uh, in the meetings with the county and Burton Ash, the long-term goal was to use this as a, a pilot, but to try to find a long-term solution for the community um, for uh, permanent um, temporary housing. Uh, and again, that's just the early stages. That's the concept that um, three agencies are, are looking at. Uh, the pilot program gives us some of that background on one of the things we learned, for example, do you need to have a campsite or that location next to services? And what we're seeing is services will come to wherever that location is, which is really cool. Um, 
and then working with Bert Nash, one of the first things that we wanted to be bringing up was we're going to start the camp, but what's the exit strategy for those campers? Um, and so we want to see, ideally, every one of those campers get a, get a soft landing and find a, a HUD wrapped rehousing opportunity. <clears throat> so that, that continues to be one of my personal and department pro top priorities is trying to get these people to a, a good location and not just, hey, the camp ended on March 31st and, and go wherever. Um, and the goal too is also get us to the winter months. So winter ends March 21st, if I recall my uh, seasons correctly. <laughs> and hopefully we're, we're back to good weather. And uh, But yeah, it, the problem's gonna be there. This year it's been larger than normal. Penny Holler, management analyst, um, that probably also coincides with the Lawrence Community Shelter. Um, they're hoping to have um, their, is the, the pods, they're hoping to have that expansion um, completed sometime in the spring. So potentially that also opens up um, other um, resources in the community. You have more about that than I have. Yeah. Um, go ahead, I, John. I've been here. Uh, just a wild idea here. Um, you know, the homelessness um, situation, I know uh, from reading about it. I don't know it personally. And maybe it's possible, I don't know, for you guys to sponsor some sort of video interviews with the people who are at the camp so the rest of the community can truly understand what this is about. Because I understand it intellectually, but I don't understand it emotionally. And I, I want to understand it emotionally. Uh, John, I'm glad you said that because I live in Pinckney, so I've had an opportunity to walk around the camp, not necessarily tour the camp itself, because, of course, they keep it a little bit. Uh, they don't want people to show up unannounced and they, they want people to feel like this is their home. So um, but not a lot of people have had that opportunity to go ahead and see exactly what the setup is, how the people relate to it or how many people work there, or, you know, how great a facility it is. So I think there's some merit to that to go ahead and, you know, spread the word to other people to show exactly how it's helping people, how they're being treated, and how it provides an opportunity for people to go ahead and move to that next step. So um, I, I think that's a great idea. And uh, I also wanted to piggyback on that as well by saying that I've, I've heard nothing but uh, good things in the Pinckney neighborhood about it um, at first. Of course, there was apprehension as, you know, as which is totally warranted because, you know, there's this new thing moving into the neighborhood. But uh, once everything's been set up and uh, the camp has been running, uh, I, I also want to compliment Stephen Mason. He's done an exemplary job running the camp itself and he's been nothing but professional. Um, but it, it's the greatest comment and the greatest compliment you can make about that camp is it's people don't notice it anymore. It's just become a part of the community. So um, I, I think that's I think that's really cool, and uh, I, I, it's a credit to Derek and his leadership, and also Stephen and, and everybody involved with the camp, and and Mitch for help set, setting it up, and you know LMH for you know participating as well. So and uh, Derek Rogers, director of Parks Rec. Um, it, one of the things that Burton Ash has been uh, reminded me of from the very beginning is be very uh, careful with and respect the uh, the privacy of the individuals in the camp. And um, a, a reporter came by, I don't know, it was last week, and it was on the case KMBC 9 News. <clears throat> and one of the individuals in the camp, um, he, he didn't, didn't care for the fact that from his perspective, he saw it as, uh, you know, we're being looked at as an experiment. And you know, I, I talked to him later, I go, you know, what if this campsite helps another community and helps other homeless people? So it, 
it's unique and it, it's kind of a, it's a hard line to balance. Um, these individuals all have different challenges in their life and you know, that it, it would just be, it's hard because even when they came through um, and I've seen other interviews in other cities where they, they allow it, but somebody's got to step forward and say, I'm willing to do an interview, but I want to keep my private life private. Jackie Becker. That, that's what I was going to say. I just think there's a real fine line there that we have to watch because these are their lives and their homes. And so just, we just need to make sure when we, you know, give the props that it's, it's being done with great respect to these people's privacy and needs. So, so I think no news is good news to know that the neighborhood isn't hearing anything and it's not making its way on Twitter through negative response and things like that. But always keep in mind that these are people and these are their homes for the moment. So. It, I will say, you know, we, if you get it, if you had an argument in your house, odds are nobody in the neighborhood knows about it unless you're really, really loud. <laughs> if you have an argument when you're in a tent city and you're in public park, usually everybody will hear about it. And so we've had one concern about an argument that went on uh, in early evening hours, and but there hasn't been violence, and that that's been really good. So. You put 20 people in close living quarters. I don't care what group of 20 people you put close living quarters, you're going to have a few disputes. But in the most part, they're trying to help each other out. They're respectful. Uh, Derek, with the colder weather uh, happening, uh, how is how are, how is the individual heaters been working out? Um, one of the things we've learned is uh, some of the things you buy at, at Walmart, Target, uh, Dick's Sporting Goods, are great for residential use, but aren't designed to be, you know, uh, some of the electrical space heaters on for, for 24 seven for 30 days. So we have got some new heaters. We've also got some of the rating heaters, the, uh, the oil field heaters. I know that in my house, I've got a small one and I keep it on low and 400 square feet, it can really get that place toasty. So we've got that and we've also got some other heaters. They've got electric blankets, they've got blankets. Um, I didn't make it out there Saturday or Sunday. It was cold this weekend. I'll go out tonight after we get done and uh, just find out how well things went temperature-wise and make sure everybody's doing okay. Can I, I'd like to, this is Lee Ice, uh, Assistant Director of Parks and Recreation, just to add a couple things to what Val had noted, uh, what she heard on the radio. The fact that Derek, Derek did have an interview last week with Channel 9 News. Uh, he's had phone calls and Zoom meetings with other communities. I know he visited with uh, Springfield, Missouri. Um, the words out there of what we're doing, a friend of mine is a consultant in the parks and recreation field, and I've never been to Grand Junction, Colorado, but he says you could close your eyes and open them in downtown and you'd think you're in Lawrence. And they've done a survey there and, and it also included the homeless community in Grand Junction, Colorado, and Lawrence was mentioned three times. Those people, they said, you need to do something like Lawrence is doing in Lawrence, Kansas. So, I mean, it's kind of out there and, and, and to go along with all this, and I know Derek wouldn't say it uh, because he's really truly led this, the, this whole thing. But I know last week we were short on staff and it was a midnight to eight shift that he took and then came to work that next morning. And so he, he doesn't really expect anything different from himself. That He wouldn't expect that at any one of us as far as an employee that he wouldn't do himself. So again, he took on that, that 12, 12 midnight to eight o'clock in the morning, went home, showered and came into work. Um, so it's pretty impressive. <laughs> Thanks. Eric, we, we're, we're, we're pretty lucky. I, I, th I think we all know that. So uh, your efforts do not go unnoticed and uh, we truly do appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have else have any uh, additional questions or comments about Camp Woody? I'm not seeing or hearing anything, so. If that's the case, uh, I'll go ahead and move us on. Um, just a little bit of a switch up, uh, considering that we have somebody here to go ahead and make comment on Mutt Run, uh, I think it probably would be good if we go ahead and move that up to the next agenda item, just so that 
you know, she doesn't have to go ahead and wait through our entire meeting. So uh, I think that would be nice. Uh, so uh, if it doesn't disrupt everybody, I would like to go ahead and move that up to item number three. All right, item number three. And uh, Mark, if you're ready, we would, we would love to hear more about the Mutt Run Dog Park and uh, community engagement update. I am ready. Mark Hecker, Assistant Director of Parks and Recreation. Um, basically just an update on where we are in process. So in October, the City Commission directed us to, to come up with the request proposals from a consulting firms to do public engagement and design of a road. Um, so where we are is we had six proposals submitted, uh, various consulting and design firms, most local or regional, there's Topeka, Kansas City, Lawrence. Uh, we reviewed those, the staff team reviewed those, um, went through them. We've selected one that we feel has the best opportunity to give us the public engagement we're looking for. It's kind of odd with this set of circumstances. We're more interested in how they will handle public engagement than we are in design services. We feel like all the firms could easily design a road or put a, put a plan on paper, but we need to have the 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 public engagement piece is kind of the star, star of this consulting thing. So what our plan is, is to take a, we're currently talking uh, scope and fee with the, the one we've selected. We hope to take that to the city commission um, January 5th. So once that's approved, then we would move forward in meeting with the steering committee and, and then starting that public engagement piece. That's about where we are, so I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Uh, I'm oh. sorry. Uh, does anybody from the board, uh, what we'll do is we'll ask questions of the board before we open it up to public comment. And I believe, Val, you're first. Well, yeah, I was just going to say the. it sounds like the road is a done deal, even though there's going to be public engagement. And so I may, I don't have a lot of experience in this, these kind of, uh, you know, requests for, uh, anyway, for the, for the submissions. So are they essentially guaranteed to get the road job if they get the public engagement job or are the two separate does it will the public engagement possibly change the road no it, it mark hecker assistant director yeah it definitely could so the public engagement piece defines what we want to do how we want to do it where we want to do it or do we want to do it at all so um what we asked for in the, in our rfp was to engage the public talk with the steering committee and engage a, a bigger community group and then come back with proposals so we said if if we're doing a road, we want to see three alternates, and then we also want to see a no build alternate. So, and that's kind of what the city commission asked us to do was to to say, okay, if this we go here, if this we go here, if not, if we can't find a solution that that's doable, then we propose a no bid or no build. So the all the consultants know that. So that's why we broke the the thing into two pieces. So they basically gave us a p a price for the public engagement and a price for design. So if, if we stop at some point, then we won't pay the rest of the bill. Okay, great, thanks. Do we have any other questions out there from Mark before we open it up to public comment? I'm not seeing any on the board here. And I, uh, Lynn, I would go ahead and remind you when we go ahead and open it up uh, that you would have, I believe, three minutes uh, for your comment there. Um, it, but, uh, it won't take me three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just wanted to let you know. Go ahead. It's all yours. <laughs> okay. Um, I just wanted to um, bring everybody up to speed on our request for a moratorium from the people at the Mutt Run. We've now surpassed uh, 1,400 signatories on that request. And um, we, we still have the same concern uh, we've expressed to Derek, who tried to fix it for us, that the steering committee 
on the steering committee, we feel like the Mutt Run is underrepresented in that there are three uh, separate representatives from three separate sports at the youth at the youth sports complex, and clearly they have they all have the same concerns. There's no difference between soccer, football, and baseball when it comes to this road, whereas the Mutt Run only has two representatives. And that is still a concern to us. So I'm bringing it up here and we'll probably bring it up again at the city commission uh, meeting. And uh, the last thing I wanted to say is thank you, Mark Hecker, for the pathway you made. It's quite lovely, a little wider than we wanted, but it was really nice. And thank you very much for doing that. And then I'm done. Okay, uh, thank you, Lynn, I appreciate it. <laughs> Um, Thank you all very much. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and Mark, if you would, could you remind us what the current composition of that steering committee is, like alluding to what Lynn said? Uh, yeah, Mark Hecker, assistant director. I, I don't have the list right in front of me, but basically we tried to get a representative from any group that is directly tied to kind of the road area. So you have a soccer person, you have a football person, you have a baseball person, uh, two Mutt Run people, uh, someone from the biking community, uh, Arboretum community. I'm missing someone, but basically it's a pretty wide range. I think there's nine or 10 people. Uh, Lynn? Uh, I just want to say that there, those, there, it's, I think it's misleading to say that you have the baseball community, the soccer community, and the football community. You have the youth sports complex community and the Mutt Run community. And the youth sports run community has three representatives and the Mutt Run has two. And now I will leave you all alone. But thank you very much and have a wonderful holiday, everybody. And Derek, I appreciate you too. Thank you. Um, Marilyn, I apologize. I know you've been trying to speak. You can go I for it. Ask, I wanted to ask Lynn a question before she disappears. Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, talk a little bit more about a moratorium because, well, let me just make that open-ended. How long do you see this moratorium going on and what do you hope is the ultimate result of it? The request for the moratorium was uh, based on the idea that uh, there are many changes being made to KDOT, that we're also going to see uh, eventually the bypass, the, being able to see what the impact of those changes will be will, is not immediate. It will take a, a, a year or two years to see how those changes have impacted the, the basic problem, which is the exiting the sports run uh, complex. So we're just asking for, ev for everyone to stop and take a breath to see if there's a way that this problem can be solved without destroying the mud run. So that we, we never, the, the, the petition was not just no, it was let's just stop and take a breath and see whether this is necessary. Does and that answer your question? Marilyn Hull again. Um, I guess question of staff, Mark, um, it was Lynn um, correct in the timeline for when we might know what KDOT is doing in the area? Uh, Mark Hecker, assistant director. So KDOT's moving forward with a overpass recommendation where, uh, walk, where the highway would basically go over and extend Wakarusa. They're moving forward with the design. It's only a 30% complete design and they don't have funding. So it's an idea, it's a good idea. Everybody shakes their head yes, but no one has the funding for it. So we don't know what timing will be on that. Is it two years, five years, 15 years, 30 years? Just unknown. And frankly, KDOT won't give us an answer. I've tried and tried and tried. You know, if I thought they were gonna move forward with that in a, in a year, then that's probably a different conversation. But and that um, Lindy and Pell, they, uh, Mutt Run, the, the, I'm also talking about the changes they've made in terms of, of traffic patter, patter, patterning um, that um, I think Dave Cronin, city engineer, said it would take 
uh, more than a year to see how that would impact the, the egress from the sports run uh, complex. And also we've expressed concerns about uh, uh, 900 road and any new road adding traffic to that because of the traffic pattern on 900 road, which you really can't I, examine or identify until we're in high season when the bikers are out and the deer are crossing and the people are going down to the river, uh, the, I mean the lake, you can't do that, so. Mark, this is John Blasek. Have you heard any uh, guidelines on their road, what they're gonna do with it, how they're gonna keep that curve there or they're gonna go over, what, what have you heard on the um, road construction or what's it gonna look like? Mark Hecker, Assistant Director of Parks and Rec. Yeah, I've actually been on the design committee, so I've got to sit in on the plans at this point, which has kind of been a fun process. So basically what they're going to do is race K-10 up. Walker Roosa, if you drive down Walker Roosa going down the hill, you can kind of almost see the, the future road across the cornfield over there. So it'll go straight through, then K-10 will raise up above it. But this is a part of a bigger project, so it's K-10 construction all the way from Iowa Street all the way out to the uh, I-70 basically. So they moved this piece forward on a faster track to try to get some type of resolution quicker than the whole thing. The whole thing's hundred plus million dollars. This one's, you know, 30 million. So it's, it's one of the bigger pieces of the whole project, but it's also, they want to get rid of that, that on grade crossing. So I feel good about that, that they're seeing that as a, a, potential problem for them. So they're trying to move that forward. Okay. Um, or I have one more question for Lynn. Since, since I haven't been in on any of your meetings, can you explain to me um, or us why you think the road would destroy, that was your term, the, the mutt run? Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> um, the, the, what we value, and I, I, I'm speaking for at least 1,400 people, <laughs> uh, what we value most about the Mud Run is where, it's where we go to get away from traffic. It is a place to simulate a walk in the country with your dog off leash. It's the only place in Lawrence you can do it. The road also has a very practical application for seniors, for uh, people who are disabled, for uh, parents with children, because it is, it's paved. So people use that road. Um, and it's also the access point to, I think it's eight different trails into the park so that we have a constantly moving uh, pattern of people and dog traffic so that we don't encounter one another. We're not funneling through. If a road went in with a fence, new trails would have to be plowed and that would further take away from the sense of open space movement. Not to mention, I only seem to care about this, but it's also a, um, a pathway for wildlife goes back and cross across that road from deer, possum, etc. Thank you all so very much for showing an interest and thanks again for the path, Mark. Good night and have a wonderful holiday, everybody. See ya. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, do, we, uh, do, do we have any further questions for uh, Mark on this? John, or did you have a question? And I'm looking through, I don't see any. Uh, but as always, if you have any questions you haven't thought about yet, but it do in the future, you can go ahead and contact Mark and just let him know. Um, thank you for letting us, and get, letting us know and giving us an update on this, Mark. Uh, I definitely think uh, we will be paying attention. <laughs> so. Um, thank you. All right, to go ahead and move us on. Uh, our next agenda item is, uh, I think we'll be talking about the revised COVID plan update. I'm not sure exactly who will be heading that update, but I'll just leave it up to you guys. 
Great. Penny Holler, Management Analyst. Uh, Lee Ice uh, will be presenting this topic. Yeah, this is Lee Ice, Assistant Director of Parks and Recreation. I don't know if how many of you have actually looked at the updated policy that's on our website. The original one that was out uh, publicized in September, I believe it was September 22nd, was updated on November 13th. Uh, I'm on the Unified Command that meets every Thursday and the health department does a report to give us an idea of where we are at on that scale of green, yellow, orange, and red. I believe it's been the last three, if not four weeks, we've been in the orange, which is one tick away from red, where it shuts everything down. However, that being said, uh, we were very close at one time at 13.8 in positivity. Since that time, we've actually gone below 10. But there's so, there's so many other factors that the health department looks at when they're determining whether or not we're in yellow, whether or not we're in orange, whether or not we go to red. And I think that's the point that we, we start looking at that crystal ball and where are we going to be two weeks from now. And so when we looked at this a month ago, we, we, were, we were thinking that once we got through Thanksgiving, it was going to be two weeks out of Thanksgiving, we're going to be able to see a, a, a large increase in the positivity rate, hospitalization, um, all, all the criteria that they look at. Uh, I think some of those have gone down, some of those have gone on the rise. And then we've got Christmas coming up, which is another two weeks out of that, uh, the social gatherings. Then you've got New Year's Eve, which is two weeks out of that. Um, so again, we're, we're very unsure where we're going to be at a month from now on January 15th. And so that's some of the planning that we have to really kind of look forward to as far as recreation. Uh, but the overall, the, the, the criteria was updated, uh, on November 13th. And that have, have any of you had an opportunity to look at that on our website or if you have any questions? Any hollow manager analysts, I can also share that on a screen share if, if it's helpful to see that if we need to answer any questions. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you, Penny. Hey, Lee, this is John Blazek. Yes, sir. You know, when I saw this, when it was sent out by Penny, I was really impressed. And, and I'll tell you why, as a, as a board member, but a community member, I know when you guys were trying to decide and, you know, we had a committee member that, you know, had friends that didn't want it open. And I made a comment because I had a lot of friends that wanted things open. I really want to come back as a professional decision-making the the work you guys go on go into with your committee and how you're trying to make it because you know you're going to have half the people like you and half the people not but you guys have really spent some really deep time on making decisions based upon county data and and that's really impressive that I didn't know you went that deep I I really like what you're doing I, I feel I mean I feel extremely safe at Rock Chalk Park you've done a wonderful job out there I'm there every day. It's clean. It's safe. People are happy. But also when they ask me, you know, I like to tell them about this. I, I enjoyed Penny sharing that with us because I had no idea you guys went that deep on trying to decide what to do. Compliments to you. Thank you, John. Well, this, this is basically the criteria that we look at every Thursday, actually every day. <laughs> Um, but it is updated every Thursday with the recommendation from the uh, Douglas County Health Department. And, and so ultimately we follow these guidelines almost to the letter, uh, or we try to. Uh, the difficult part is to try to predict where we're gonna be at, like I said, two, three weeks down the road uh, and been able to plan for things. That, that's very difficult. I know, I know the school district is changing some of their criteria, which they have not completed yet. Uh, the Kansas um, High School Association has updated theirs for winter sports. 
Um, they've come back and they did a revote last week that allows two people in to the gyms um, uh, for, for the winter sports, to spectators. And so this is kind of, it's always on the move and it's always changing. Um, but this is pretty much the criteria that we've gone with since November 13th when it was put out. And so it really, it guides us in what we can and cannot do based on the information that's shared with us weekly with the, with the Douglas County Health Department. And so if you go to our lprd.org website, it'll show every Thursday that upper range, whether we're green, yellow, orange, or red, and then there's a link to get to all this information that says orange, and this is what we can and can't do. Mm -hmm. There you go. Thanks, Penny. And Roger up the updates that every Thursday, as soon as we get the information from the Douglas County Health Department. And like you said, Lee, I, we probably don't anticipate this going down too much considering the holidays that are coming up, so. That's correct. <laughs> uh, Lee, this is, uh, this is Pat Collette. Is, is it my, under, my understanding correct that probably the biggest change was the suspension of the winter um, activities, the classes and that kind of thing, because you had been doing those right. And, and that was, uh, I, I thought I read something in, the, in a press release that, that the winter um, classes had been canceled, at least through January, is that correct? Right, uh, this is Lee Ice Parks and Recreation. That's correct, correct, Pat. We and that was a difficult decision a couple of weeks ago when we made that, and we started looking at at that as a staff. The the fact that we wanted to make sure we did did everything safely. We knew that we were getting into holiday season with social gatherings, with families, travel, all that information we're getting from the Douglas County Health Department. We were going to be transitioning into winter programs, which were going to be completely kind of a restart in January, February, March, which typically is our winter season. You know, with, for instance, with youth athletics, we, we ended up, we spent a lot of time in doing a lot of work in providing practices, enrollment, scheduling, hiring officials, and then we had to refund because we had to stop. And so that was one of the things that we had to decide, do we really want to start something that we think we may have to stop the second week of January mm -hmm. and have to do all these refunds? And then that, that's, that's a lot of work on staff. And, and it's not that they mind because they're always trying to find something to do, much like the IEPs, much like the pool school, a lot of other things that may not be recreation based but they are trying to provide for the community and other things. And so one of the things that we were able to hold on to throughout all this was the fact that we want to keep it, as long as we're in orange, facilities will be open, which still gives people the opportunity to get into the weight rooms, do the track, do some of the things that they may normally do outside that now that they could come inside to do uh, the, the, uh, the cardio machines. So there are going to be activities as long as we stay in orange. If we get back to yellow and we see this all decreasing, that's when we're going to really look at this the 1st of January and tell staff that, okay, Douglas County Health thinks this is going to start declining in two weeks. What can we do at the end of January, 1st of February, that we can start up and have registration for a couple of weeks, hire staff, put schedules together, do classes, do the things that we were doing prior to Christmas. But, the, but when we made this decision a couple of weeks ago, it didn't look like that was the path that we were gonna to go to. It was, it was actually gonna get worse before it got better. And so instead of in getting all these people enrolled in classes and then have to come back again and give refunds and cancel, we made the decision to pump the brakes, take it slow, look at it the 1st of January, and then make decisions on what we can do two to three weeks down the road that we don't have to do refunds and we could get classes and programs started again. So hopefully it's just going to be a two to maybe a three week slowdown. We don't know. Um, I wish we did. Um, nobody can tell us where we're going to be at, like I said, a month from now. Right. Yeah. Great. Thank you. 
Lee, could I add to that just a couple of things? Hi, Roger. Hi, uh, Roger Steinbrock, uh, marketing supervisor. Um, a couple other things. I, I, I don't think we wanted to give the impression to people like they had to enroll in classes. If we have programs that are being offered, people may say to themselves, oh, I need to enroll. Um, especially during COVID, we didn't want to basically create that, that impetus for people to go out and, and have to be enrolled in a, in a, a program with other people. Uh, we did keep the gyms open uh, so that it would be low impact individual type thing, as Lee was mentioning. But the other piece of this is because we are so have such a generous community, uh, we look at equity. And since facilities are free to the public, this also helped us from the equity standpoint as well. Thanks, Roger. I have a, a comment. Uh, this is John Nalbandian. Um, I have three classes at Holcomb. I swim at the aquatic center and I walk at the sports complex. I'm, I haven't heard anybody complain about the guidelines. I think we live in a community where we are sensitive to what the health department is saying and the extent to which you guys can follow those guidelines. So my sense is follow the guidelines and be confident that the people who are using the facilities, while there may be an occasional um, you know, objection, that the vast majority of us are on your side. Thanks, John. Lee? Yes, sir. This is John Blasek. John, I want, I want to compliment you on that and agree with you. I, I think I'm, I'm out there often, Rock Chalk Park every day. I've never heard a person complain. And I think people are ready for that. They trust you. You're following guidelines. And I think that was a great compliment by John. Uh, comment. A compliment to one of your employees the other day, Lee. I'm out walking and I have my mask on and it has dropped about an eighth of an inch below my nose. And I'm not paying attention. And someone, one of the employees comes up, you need to have it over your nose. And I appreciated that. So compliments to those guys. I, I agree with what John said 100%. I've not heard any complaints. Uh, Jackie Becker, I have a question, Lee. So if we go into the red and we end up having to close everything, I'm assuming because you have been doing incredible things with evolving and pivoting, would we try to work to try to do an earlier start to anything outdoor or, or I don't know, what, do we have options for, you know, if schools stop and how do we keep, how do we keep kids doing things and kids, you know, having space if their parents have to work and that kind of stuff? Well, you want winter kickball? We'd give that a shot. <laughs> I, I would, if I could play kickball in the snow, you know I will. <laughs> our, our, people would, our people could be creative with that possibly. Um, we have not looked at starting up any of the sports stuff, but that doesn't mean we couldn't possibly look into something else. Uh, you know, the, all the, the, the online learning stuff, we're trying to redirect some of our staff into some other things. I know that we've got a few of the staff that were doing gymnastics that are now assisting with the IP classes. So we are, we are utilizing our people the best that we can within our department to help out with other things, whether it be the online learning school at, at the aquatic center, whether it be the IP, um, several every, other areas right now. So, but that doesn't mean that we would not look at possibly doing some other things. We're hoping Honestly, Jackie, but we're hoping that once we get to the first of the January with with in trying to forecast where we might be the first of February, that we're going to be able to start up our classes. And then we're not that far away from outdoor activities in March anyway, March, April, May, when the act, outside activities are going to be starting up. So it, it's again, it's, it's kind of a slowdown period or, or pump the brakes, like I said, but we'll revisit a, a lot of stuff the first of January. And hopefully we're going to be able to do some things by the end of January 1st of February. And we'd hopefully we don't get to red. 
I agree. I think we're all hoping. Uh, I think uh, that and just the, you know, the news of a vaccine has probably gave, given everybody a little bit of a boost. So, a hope. yeah. So, does uh, anyone else have any uh, questions for Lee on this? I'm just looking through. I don't see anything. Uh, thank you again for the update, Lee, and all, and all the work you guys are doing just to, as Jackie said, pivot and make yourself available for the community and just to work with it the best you can because it's just, just a, it's just a circumstance that we're all having to deal with and, you know, make do. So uh, we really appreciate your efforts and that of, that of your staff. All right, uh, I think I'll go ahead and move us on to our next agenda item. It looks like a donation policy. Thank you, Bart. Uh, Roger Stein, Brock, Marketing Supervisor. Uh, this is a, a policy that we have needed for quite a while but didn't have. Um, it kind of falls in line with our sponsorship policy uh, that we had done in 2017. Uh, this allows us to receive donations, whether it be uh, material, monetary, land, uh, other things like that. We've had several things over the years that we've been, we've been given by people, land and, and so forth, but we haven't had any kind of a policy uh, to direct us on this. Um, so this is kind of set up similar to the sponsorship policies with three different levels. Uh, one at the department level, uh, one at the uh, city manager level, and then at the city commission level for value. Um, and of course, it is the value that the donor says it is. So if there, if it is a piece of land, you know, we, there is appraisals that are given on those types of things. Um, but I know there have been people over the years that have tried to give us equipment for our facilities, whether it be a, um, a treadmill or something like that. Uh, we also, you know, take in kind donations for programming. Uh, I know in the past we've done it for several different, like the Daddy Daughter Date Night had a, a program underwriting people donating stuff, food and, and the like. So this just kind of sets that up uh, in, a, in a way that has a policy and that people know what we accept and what we don't. Um, and then there's a the process to it. Uh, they, there is a form, uh, there was two, two things on there, the, the actual form that people would fill out uh, that kind of determines what, basically tells us what they're, what they're wanting to donate, and then just the policy that goes through the, the background of how, the, how, we, how we select things and how that process goes. I'll be open for questions. I, I have a comment. Uh, I'm on the Watkins Museum Board, and we uh, went through this as well very recently. When I read the document, um, I, I was a little bit confused because my first reaction was, oh my gosh, 20,000 is, or 25 or whatever it was, is kind of the maximum that we're looking at. I didn't realize that what this document is, is basically who is authorized to be able to accept the, the donation. Right. Um, so I, I don't, I don't, you referred to another document, I'm not sure, uh, but at some point, is it, is it possible that we have a document that actually lays out if you donate X amount of money, this is the kind of recognition that you get. Like for that, example, that, what, what, what would it take for me to sponsor a splash park? I, that kind of thing. Well, board member, I, you probably asked that of staff, but I just, because of my background in philanthropy, there's a difference between a donation and a sponsorship. The sponsorship, there's a, usually some quid, quid pro quo, like uh, recognition of some kind. But, but in its purest form, a donation, there are no strings attached. Right. 
But this document is about who decides. It's not about the, you know, what you get for it. Right. And one of the things, John, the, the levels actually had to be changed within it because I've had it reviewed by legal and by finance as well. And finance, <laughs> that the, the 20,000 threshold needed to go to the city commission. Yeah. And so I, it was 25, so I moved it down and had to restructure a little bit. But uh, basically, like Marilyn said, this is more or less just the donation and how, how yeah. we would accept it. And you know, I'm good with that. What I want to know is what would it take to sponsor the, uh, the sports complex? What would it take to sponsor a splash park? That kind right. Of and that's in the sponsorship policy we have now in terms of recognition that goes into the friends of the park. And that's one of those oh. other things that we need to spell out a little bit more on. We don't have a written policy on the friends of the park. But we do recognize people uh, for donations and that type of thing over the past. We have anyway, we used to have a reception and uh -huh. prayed them through the city commission meeting, but we haven't done that in, in quite a while. Well, I'm, I'm sure that's not high on the agenda, but nevertheless, uh, it would be something. We'll continue to work towards those things for sure. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'd love to, I, I mean, it depends how much it costs, but you know, if it's like $10,000 <laughs> to sponsor a splash park on East Lawrence, you know, I'll listen to you. Uh, this is Val Renault, board member, and um, I was on a committee with Jackie and Sandy Hall, and we were working with Roger on all of uh, laying out all the assets of, of the department and what each one cost or, you know, what you could contribute. So I just wanted to in support Roger and saying that that's been underway, and I think we, we were meeting fairly regularly, and then COVID hit, so... Uh, it's there. Right, well, that's, that allowed me to do this policy because this one's been in the works for a while. We've had some donors that have wanted to provide uh, assets of some sort, land or whatnot. And so we kind of had to have this in place to be able to start receiving some of those requests right. and, and judging on them. So I'm just glad to finally get to the point that we got it down on paper. Uh, Jackie Becker. Uh, John, you're absolutely welcome to join our, our subcommittee when it gets going again, since we don't have Sandy anymore. So <laughs> maybe you can help us put some numbers on some stuff, but uh, it's still out there. And, and uh, I think, you know, hopefully we can keep it going once we sort of know where money in our community is going after all of this. So Count me in. <laughs> uh, Marilyn, did you have any, uh, do you have a question? I did, I did. Um, Marilyn Hull, board member. Roger, does this policy cover uh, fundraising that another entity might do to fund something at Lawrence Parks and Recreation? And just to disclose, I'm on the board of Friends of Lawrence Area Trails. And for example, if the Friends of Lawrence Area Trails wanted to see a new trail in uh, on Parks and Recreation property, and we were willing to fundraise for that. Does this donation policy cover that, or would that be something separate? You know, that's a good question, Marilyn. Um, well, I mean, to me, you you'd be raising the funds you have the funds in hand then it would be a donation so it would fall within these levels now if it was something where you're going to be raising the funds you know and you're discussing now that's probably not here it has to kind of be discussed and then figured out at what level if if, if indeed like parks and rec have to help fund with maintenance or if there's ongoing costs if that's something that we could do, and that's kind of that negotiated thing that would probably have to take place, I would assume. But I will defer to Derek on that. I'm, I'm thinking that this covers the initial gift, but not, not necessarily some of those other, you know, the ramifications and the different details of a, of a trail, so to speak. 
Yeah, I was looking under level three, the department director donations are projected to be valued at basically under $10,000, may be approved by the uh, department director. And so I think what you're saying is, let's say it's a $10,000 project, $5,000 grant, and Parks and Rec says we'll match that. Is that approval at the director level? I would say yes, because we're only getting $5,000 of benefit for split the project. Don't know if that's answering what you were thinking. Well, well, um, I think the question has come up with the Friends of Trails. Um, I mean, they, there's two sides of, to this. There's the city wanting to protect itself. There's also the nonprofit wanting to protect itself. If we go out to the community and say, we want to raise $100,000 to put a trail in this exact place at this exact time, then we have to have an assurance from the city that if we raise the promised funds that that trail will actually go in in that location at that time. So it's, I, it, I get the 10,000 thing, but I, if we're thinking bigger, um, that's where I would like to know if this policy is adequate because we've approached uh, the city manager about coming up with an MOU and he, he kind of was putting us off and saying, the city's coming out with a donation policy and it will cover that. So now I don't know if the parks and rec donation policy mm -hmm. is it, or if there's some overarching thing that the city would do for larger projects or partnerships. Yeah, but the only thing that this policy does is say who would approve it. That's all it does. I, I think what maybe what you're talking about, Marilyn, would fit more in a sponsorship category. Exactly. Um, now, whether well, the name of the organization is there yes. as sponsor, I don't know. But it, if you're asking for something specific like that, it seems like the sponsorship policy would kick in, which has similar levels for mm -hmm. approval. But um, it right. also spells out different things, like, you know, whether you want to sponsor a bench or whether you want to, you know, there are a lot of things that people can sponsor. And also, Roger Steinbrock, marketing supervisor, with the sponsorship policy, it would spell out like the the flat wanted to be named or you know that type of thing for the trail. Then they could be that could also be part of that, that sponsorship as well. If there is that kind, I mean, donations like this, this for this program that that in terms of this policy, it's more for just giving, you know, rather than, than having that name or something attached to it as well. But that's not to say that within the, the framework of that, when they write their, you know, their agreement, that there may be something written into it as well. Okay. And that then would have to be accepted by whatever body um, that would, it would be go before. Okay, thank you. Eric Rogers, Director of Parks and Recreation. And just looking at this under Section 5, level of donation, donations that are projected to be valued at 20000 or more to the city or that involve naming rights for parks and rec facility or parks shall require the approval of the city commission. I don't know if that would be something that could go for the city commission and just say, hey, we want to make a donation, get the city commission approval ahead of time for we're raising money and we're going to donate $100,000 to X. Just a thought. Yeah, that would be more the situation where you're making an agreement before the funds are raised because um, you have to honor the donor's intent. So if we go out and, and, and say, we're raising money for this, we need to have some assurance from the city that it'll actually happen. Um, and we need to know if there are any other um, provisions or whatever that might restrict what fundraising we do or don't do. Um, so it sounds like maybe we need to take this conversation offline at some point and maybe with the city management staff and see if there's anything in addition that needs to um, be developed. Right, well, and, and this, the Roger, thing about the- It'd be I'm helpful sorry. just um, as we're having the conversation, if you could let them know what the next steps for this policy are and what we're um, looking for them in terms of this discussion. 
Sure. Uh, what I was going to say was that this is just the start of an, any kind of policy can be updated over the years. So I, I, I expect it to have some changes even in the near future potentially for this. Uh, what, I would, what I was hoping to do tonight is to get your consideration for this uh, in support of it. And then in January, we'd be moving it to the city commission for, for their approval uh, to make it a policy for the department. Um, you know, we do have policies that are more, uh, you know, that Derek can create on his own within the department, but there are some that we push through to the city commission uh, to have that transparency and also have it more engaging with the public. And this is one of those that we have chosen to move to the city commission. So um, I would just ask for people, you know, for potential vote on um, moving this forward. Uh, you know, as a former city commissioner and mayor, what you're proposing here goes on the consent agenda. Right. I'm really not concerned about this. What I'm concerned about is how much money will it take to get my name on a trail, a, a building, a whatever. This policy has nothing to do with that. So, I mean, this is a no brainer. Okay, big deal. All right, fine. But the issue that we still have to confront is how much money does it take in order to name something? Derek Rogers, Director of Parks and Recreation. You're correct. That's um, under the sponsorship. One of the things, the reason we brought this about, we have, I can think of at least three, three large donations of land that people want to donate large amounts of property to Parks and Recreation. And one of the um, thoughts of revisiting this, somebody can, you know, let, let's say, John, you donate 100 acres of something to us, and it's going to require a lot of maintenance. And But because where it is, maybe it's not something that you could ever build on. So you're tired of paying taxes, and you're going to go, we're going to give it to the city. Maybe a great asset for the city. We, we need that park. Most of our parks are in, in the floodplain, floodway. Fantastic. But the city should have the rights and, and the time, not rights, to review that offer to say, look, we, we've assessed what it's going to cost annually to maintain this property. You're going to burden us. And that's where we were trying to go with this. So we go to the commission in January. It, you approve it here, and it goes to the commission, gets approved. January, then we will bring the three or four additional properties that they're wanting to donate, we'll evaluate them, and then we'll bring it back to the city commission with a yes or a no. Um, I and believe, just, I'm sorry, uh, Bart, Roger Steinbrock, marketing supervisor. In terms of naming rights, that there was a section within the sponsorship policy that does go into naming rights. Now, that could be something we need to add to a donation uh, policy, but I would assume that when they, when they basically give us a donation, they're wanting something potentially in return, um, more than just a thank you note. Um, so it's, I think those things are kind of sometimes uh, negotiable as as from the from the donation and the people that it goes to. So, like if you're talking a piece of land and you're donating it to city commission at that time, they would probably look at the naming rights at that point in time. I would assume. I know that uh, when we started talking with the sponsorship policy, they were talking about bricks and mortar and they actually put in several different criteria uh, for the sponsorships uh, in terms of looking at if they're investing in the community as well with the, the facility that they're naming. Um, so it could be at that time that that's part of the discussion uh, when, they, when they're donating the piece of land or property. It could be, but you're really putting the city commission in a difficult position. Point taken. Um, and uh, Roger, just, to, just so we can make it clear for everybody, uh, staff is asking for a recommendation to city commission to adopt the policy, not asking for approval, correct? Correct, correct. Okay. 
Yeah, but this policy is simple to approve. I mean, why wouldn't you approve this policy? That's not the issue. The issue is the, like uh, Marilyn was saying, the sponsorship. You know, what does it take in order to sponsor? This, all this is, is a matter of who, who, uh, who is able to authorize the co contribution. That, that's not a big, it's really not a big deal, folks. Yeah, I, I also think this is super straightforward. And if the question is, does the advisory board um, approve this to go to the city commission for consideration, I would be willing to make a motion to that effect. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, and would I would second. Thank John. you, John. Uh, John Nalbanian with the second is, uh, is, are there any further questions or any further comments on this? It does seem pretty straightforward. Seeing as there are none, uh, all those in favor, please say aye or raise your hand. Something there. Any opposed? Do the opposite. All right. The ayes have it. And uh, um, I think, uh, yeah, as, as John and Marilyn have said, this looks to be pretty straightforward. The, the the overriding ambiguity of the sponsorship in the higher levels is probably eventually what will need to be nailed down just because especially when you're talking about gifts or sponsorships of that magnitude i would think that some sort of guarantees or uh, would have to be attached to it to, to make sure that both sides can come to an agreement on it so uh, this is would... this is Pat. I have a have a comment. What I'm hearing from the discussion, though, I think, is that you know that we have been talking about sponsorship for the last couple of years, and so I, what I'm hearing is some urgency to move forward with with that to get some resolution. You know that you know this this became really a big issue when we were looking at shortfalls in budget and and looking at other ways to develop revenue and and so you know if there's some way to move that up on the priority list of things to um, to get done to get that that policy in place that seems like a fairly uh, important uh, important uh, priority right I, I would just also say this is Roger Steinbrock working supervisor in the sponsorship policy section eight, talks about parks and facility naming rights, sponsorships and how that is. And basically it goes down to uh, when they, when the city commission reviews for naming rights, they look at the cost of instruction or purchase of an asset, the amount of bonds issued related to the asset, the amount of annual bond payments. So there are some specific criteria spelled out for naming of a park or a facility. Um, within Parks and Recreation on the sponsorship policy side of things. You know, this John Nubandian, if this, if the sponsorship naming issue is a big issue, I really don't want to see us trying to invent it ourselves. This has had to have been confronted in jurisdiction after jurisdiction after jurisdiction. So you guys who are part of the Parks and Recreational Professional Association, it's not that hard to go online and to find out what other jurisdictions are doing here. At this point, I don't see that as a, you know, a top priority. But if it is, please don't let us try to invent it as if no one else has done it. Jackie Becker, uh, I just want to say that we have been doing that research, John. There's so much to take into consideration because you can sell out your community, you know, sometimes perhaps with a buying right or a name of an individual or a company that may not follow the guidelines of what our community believes in. And I think Roger has really taken a really prudent approach to it all uh, just from the meetings that we had had before COVID happened and, and we've taken a new approach to almost everything we're doing. Um, that it really has to be talked about in our community too and what our values are for what sponsorship means. 
Uh, the only thing I would say about the the form, you know, is, is that Marilyn made it so quickly to talk about was to make sure when this gets to city commission, people understand it's donations and not sponsorship. So if it does get pulled off the agenda and then you have a lot of people who don't know the difference between the two. So maybe making sure that's really clear when that gets to city commission, that this is different. It's not sponsorship. This is donations exclusively. Thank, Thank you, Jackie. That's very helpful for me. And John, I would add that uh, you would be a welcome addition to the sponsorship subcommittee as well. So, Come in. All right. All right. We got you. We got you. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, does anyone else have any uh, questions? If not, if so, we can potentially move those offline just to go ahead and keep the meeting moving. Uh, but uh, thank you. Uh, for your, your comments and your information there, Roger, on that. We really, really appreciate it. Um, but uh, yeah, to just go ahead and keep us on board and keep us going. Uh, I'll go ahead and move on to our next item. Uh, looks like that would be the staff update. Do we exactly have anything other than the attachment that was, uh, that was there? Penny Heller, Management Analyst. Um, nope, that was, uh, I think it was three, a three-page staff update, um, complete with pictures. So hopefully you get an understanding. Um, this does include some of the, um, the pool school, the remote learning for um, uh, children of essential employees, um, as well as um, the Boys and Girls Club being held at Sports Pavilion Lawrence and I, I think Annette's, um, the children with IEPs, I think that program is in here too. So hopefully some of these pictures are, are worth maybe a thousand words. <laughs> they are beautiful pictures. I, I, I'm, I'm glad to see the, that we're keeping those kids active and, and motivated. That's awesome. Um, Lee, Ice, Lee Ice, Assistant Director of Parks and Recreation. I just want to give a shout out to my uh, staff that actually provided me these pictures uh, to kind of give you some idea of what they're doing. I, again, pictures are worth a thousand words and, and I love putting this together. It, it really shows what they're doing at each one of these locations and it's pretty impressive. I agree. Uh, all right. Does anyone have any comments? I'm sorry, I skipped over the concerns of the board, I'll put that one next. But does anyone have any comments on the staff updates? Yeah, just one thing, you know, here we are sitting pandemic in the middle of COVID-19, days are getting shorter, it's getting colder, what do we do? And you know, we need to start thinking about what happens post pandemic after um, COVID-19, hopefully the vaccines come through and I'm gonna be optimistic, let's say hopefully April, things are looking good. April 2nd of 2021 will be Parks and Rec's 75th anniversary. So we'd like to dream big and you know, what can we do as a community? And it goes back to unmistakable Lawrence, unmistakable identity, um, health, wellness, um, multimodal. So we're gonna try, this is my big goal, don't have anything really wrong yet, but dream big and do some things in the community that, you know, we all think, hey, wouldn't it be great to do some of this? Um, so it may be some, uh, it's called Open Streets. If you look at it, Open Streets ICT is a good example. ICT is the three letter identifier for Wichita. Uh, there's an organization that does this in 80 communities across the nation. And for example, Wichita, the block off uh, four miles of Douglas Boulevard and activate the space for health, wellness, biking, walking, exercise. Um, it's a give back to the community. It, is, it would take some time to do it, but we have some big dreams and we'd like to do some of those events. And I think post COVID will be the right time to do this. And maybe in some areas of the city where in the past we weren't able to get it done, but maybe under the leadership of Parks and Rec, pulling some groups in that don't normally work together, we can do some pretty big things. And we'd be looking for folks from the board um, to help out on this process. And uh, we've got some volunteers in the department that are excited about it. Roger, one of them, and uh, some other people. So 
just kind of a heads up and a prelude of we want to start looking down the road. Oh, and um, I'm pretty sure Mark pushed the button. You know, one of the things that we always need is barricades. And one of the things that's always hard for nonprofits and other organizations when they close down streets is um, contracting that out. So we ordered 60 barricades. So now we'll have 70 in the community that hopefully we can provide a better rate and try to save our community members some money and do some neat things. That's all I got. Jackie Becker, event planner, that makes me really happy. Great job, Parks and Rec. That's definitely something that's really short in this community, hard to come by, and uh, will make so much difference for events, especially like the Kansas Food Truck Fest. Uh, we never have enough of anything, so this is excellent news to hear that. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Board of Lee Eyes Parks and Recreation, there is, there is one staff member that I'd like to recognize that I, I didn't get this information into the packet because I received it late. Uh, to Ryan Cloud at Eagle Bend Golf Course, he's our assistant pro out there. He's been, and I'll have more information when the award is presented in March, but the PGA has awarded the, the Midwest section, the, the 2020 Deacon Palmer Award uh, to Ryan uh, in the Midwest. And this award bestows special recognition of a PGA golf professional who personally displays outstanding integrity, character, and leadership. This individual is an unsung hero at their facility and in their community who, deserve, who serves to inspire, empower, and assist others, both inside and out the game. It was Ryan and Greg Danovic early on that, that volunteered with Derek to assist with the pools, and the, the showers down at the aquatic center before, when we were shut down as far as the golf at that time. Um, when the golf really started picking up and we were able to reopen April 22nd, we were almost out of the golf uh, business for about a month. And since that time, we've had almost 17,000 rounds of golf being played from April 22nd to December 1st, another 4,000 that, that visited to the driving range. And so, I mean, a shout out to them and to Ryan and Derek Danovic and the staff at the golf course, because this has really been a golf season that never ends. I mean, they were open, they were full last week. So they, other than the fact that when we shut them down March 13th to, to April 22nd, they got things up and running in less than a month uh, and, and really ne never missed a beat. And I mean, they'll be, they'll be still taking tee times next week when it's 50 degrees. Lee? Yes, sir. This is John Vlasic, board member. I volunteer out there, and I want to give those guys kudos and agree with you 100%. It's unbelievable the number of people that come through there, I mean, on a day, on good weather. Last Monday, they were packed. And compliments to those two gentlemen for what they're doing out there and fighting the odds, but people are still out there every day wanting to play the game of golf, and they're there with carts out and course ready. And compliments to you too, because I think I think that goes on your job responsibility from what I've seen. I know you can't beat the two pros. We have two pros out there. <laughs> Bart, I have one thing that might add. Um, yeah, go ahead. Share a screen real quick. Uh, go. Oh, there you go. Are you seeing a trail? Yep. Yes, we're seeing it. Uh, the trail Lynn was referencing is out of the dog, Mutt Run Dog Park. So parking's here. We had already had a trail here. What our staff did with the contractors help is we extended that trail to make a loop back to the road. So now you can go out there and take a walk with your dog without getting your feet muddy if you prefer. Or if you prefer to get muddy, you can go anywhere you want to out here. I just wanted to show you there, we're making progress on trails. That's an ag lime surface trail. So that's the same surface we have on the top of the levee over in North Lawrence. And we've also, and, and I'll bring pictures to the next meeting, but the park property out by the new police station, we've developed a new trail on that park property. So we're kind of moving forward this, this winter with some of these trails that we've been talking about building. So anyway, I just wanted to give you a visual aerial on that one. 
Thank you, Mark and Lee. Uh, Mark, it seems that that trail is well received already. So good job on that. Thanks. And uh, Lee, thank you for letting us know about Ryan. That's awesome. That's good to see he's being properly acknowledged for everything he's doing for the community. Um, okay, uh, does anybody have any question, questions about the staff update? If not, I will move us on to our, I, I skipped over concerns of the board. Uh, does anybody have any concerns or uh, items of interest they wanna bring forward? Uh, this is Pat Phillips, board member. Last meeting, um, I think her name was Clonice Hill. She spoke to Susquehanna Park. I'm gonna beat that up, I know. Um, and I took a walk. I hadn't been out there in quite a while, so I took a walk out to check it out again. And I think there was a couple of things that she spoke about. And one was signage and the other one is to have restrooms. And um, I mean, that area was just fabulous. I envisioned for concerts and I could just see that at some point um, being a great place to be able to um, utilize that area if it did have bathrooms, you know, and there was proper signage. My question is, after someone does come and speak to us, shares that information, where does it go? I mean, do, is that something that you, you discuss, Derek, with your staff or? Um, yeah, I would say Mark and I have at least a sesquicentennial point discussion every six months, if not sooner. Uh, Plenty Hill has been a true advocate since the uh, inception of, of the point. Uh, she's also uh, heavily in, involved with uh, KLWN and a radio show and, and Rogers. So she usually reaches out to me quarterly to every six months. Um, logistically, I, I think she understands at least for the, the challenges of getting um, running water to that location and power and electric. And Mark can talk to it a little better to get, we can't, we can't run power lines over the uh, spillway to get power to the point. I, there's just some logistical things that make that hard. I can't remember the cost of the CIP project to, to build the uh, to build it, but it's always in the back of my mind on how can we start small and go big. And Mark, I'll let you fill in. It, it doesn't fall on deaf ears because we're always bringing stuff up. I think we added a solar light up there trying to stop some vandalism. We're always replacing rocks that end up getting broke up there. Um, depending on the line of the road, I think that could be a, an asset to um, the point if the road goes through and goes a little north. It, it's just a tough one with all the other uh, priorities within Parks and Rec. I'll let Mark speak. Mark Ecker, System Director. So every time we get a concern expressed, we go out and assess it and see if we can remedy the situation. So the littler things she was talking about, the signage, we've already ordered the signs. There's a couple of stones that were broke up there. Those that actually had already been ordered. So we knew about those. They've since been installed. You know, the bigger things, obviously restrooms are, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to get there. We've talked, always talked about an amphitheater up there, which is $1.2 million. It's in the CIP, hasn't quite gotten to the funding level. So it's always just a matter of priority on the big stuff. Uh, I don't disagree with her dream. I think the dream is would be cool. I think it'd be cool to sit up there and have concerts and you look out over the lake and, and everything else. It's just a matter of prioritization. And it's so far out there, you know, just getting water and sewer and electric there, you'd spend a half million dollars. So that's kind of the hard part of the project. Thank you. This is John Blazik, board member. Pat, I agree with you. I listened to her last week or last month. First of all, I didn't say anything because I didn't know how you pronounce that word, <laughs> but I didn't know where it was. So I went out there and looked at it with my wife and I'm kind of like what Mark said. I think it'd be a great vision. I think it's a cool area, but I think with road construction, the, the, the cost, I think it's something there's got to be some creative minds because I do agree with you, Pat. I think that'd be a great area, but I also understand Mark's piece, uh, what he's talking about. I will also say I've had three inquiries for dates on stones, probably that Clinice has either brought to us here in the last week or two or people that tuned in and 
uh, listen to her from the last meeting. So we're still fielding people to, to fill in the, the, the years without uh, date, with just dates. This is Marilyn Hull, board member. It seems to me that what she's, part of what she's sad about is that um, the, the project's visibility has uh, decreased over time. Because um, I remember when there was an active fundraising campaign and there was a lot of talk in the community and some people were sponsoring stones. And over time, it's just, um, She's been the only one that I'm aware of. There are probably some other people, but the only voice in the community that's kind of keeping that project alive. And it seems to me, if if it, if you really want to complete it, it would have to be a community-wide project. I don't think it's totally on parks and recreation. It would have to be yeah. something that the entire city, the business community, the residents in the city um, and any others, um, prioritized. And um, I don't, unless it's a community wide thing, I'm not really sure what parks and recreation can do to give that project the visibility that she wants it to have. I think uh, this John Nalbandian, I think Marilyn makes a great point. The issue is how to get it on the city council, city commission's agenda. And, you know, I mean, one way is to influence Parks and Rec, and then Parks and Rec pushes it up. But the more direct route is just get support from the city commission. If you can't get support from the city commission, hey, you know, you're on a project that doesn't have a lot of support. So, I mean, that's that would be my advice. But uh, yeah, no, 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 I agree with both of you guys. And at the very least, I, I think uh, what Parks and Rec, you know, what we can do is at least make sure that, you know, and I'm glad to see that those guys have ordered signs, make sure that there's proper signage and, you know, at least pay attention to it to, you know, if there is vandalism or if there are some broken stones to make sure that, you know, that's rectified. But I agree on a grander scale, it's, it's going to be a really heavy lift. If it would be for Parks and Rec that it would probably be more appropriate that it was a if it was a community wide, community driven initiative. So, uh, given the scale right. of it and you know everything we're talking about, so. Right. I mean, is there a city commission advocate for this? If not, they got a problem. Uh, does anybody else have any, are there any, are any, any further concerns of the board? Thank you guys for that comment. And, and thank you guys for giving us an update on Sesquicentennial Park. Got it right. Got it right. I know I did. All right. I am not seeing any further comments of the board for the board. All right. That's that's it. I think that's it, folks. Uh, would I I would entertain a motion to go ahead and adjourn? This is Marilyn Hull, board member. I move we adjourn. Okay. No. I'll second that. All right. Can't be back there. Sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, all right, I'm Marilyn Hull with the motion, and Jackie Becker with the second. Uh, seeing as uh, I'm seeing there are no questions or additional comments. All those in favor of adjourning, say aye or raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing or seeing none? All right, guys. Thank you for attending and thank you for your comments and your contributions. And thank you, Parks and Rec staff, for always giving us the great information. So we, we really appreciate you guys and all that you're doing right now. And um, yeah, just thank you. Happy holidays. Happy guys. holidays. Thank you, everybody. Nice working with Thank you, Pat. Pat. Thank you. Yes, Thank Pat. You. Oh, <laughs> see you go. I'll, I'll, I'll see you for sure. Bye-bye. Bye, all.